I had some background with computer science before I went to law school, um, and I meant to say I was a productive member of society at one point, and then, and then I went to work for a regulator, and then, well, I'm really productive now, and uh, so I just want to make sure that it's clear. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about stuff that more or less is in sort of the academic space and applied things, but um, I'm not representing any views of the commission or anyone else. In case you're curious, that's what it looks like in Japanese, so I usually have those as well. Um, but today I want to talk about a little bit, um, not a lot of talking, pardon me? Okay. Let's see if it'll pop up for us here, so give me a second. But I want to talk a little bit, just briefly, about some of the reasons why it's relevant to talk about data in particular, um, and get a little bit of background, uh, at least from my perspective. We've talked a little bit about what the definitional sort of, um, sort of starting point for legal hacking is. And at least my perspective is, again, that we're, we're talking about things like the internet or mobility or other sorts of, of technology pushing against the traditional way that legal practice or, or, or um, some of the other specialty areas that we work in, policy space, um, had typically worked. And so we're seeing the changes being forced on us in some ways. And um, uh, it's probably worth just talking about that real briefly. Um, before we get into the workshop section, which is really where we'll, we'll want to start, you know, maybe cluster into groups of four. If you don't have a laptop with you, I, I know that there are several people around that do. Um, we've talked about maybe some of the tools that we'll be playing with. I'll have videos to show what it would look like if you were tappity tapping. Um, because I think we'll want to talk about, you know, the struggle that I think many of us are, are working with, especially as legal practitioners, about do we really want to invest the time in developing a subject matter expertise in these technology things? Is that going to be fruitful? Are we really trying to just bring ourselves to a, a better understanding of what the technology offers so we can evaluate vendors better? I think that's a, a situation that any sort of, um, sort of knowledge worker is struggling with right now. How much of the technology problem are, in effect, full stack, or things that you internalize in your teams or you do personally, versus how much of it is sort of maybe an outsourcing problem or across matrix or a crowdsourcing or other sorts of scenarios. So I think maybe um, one goal for today will be, let's actually type some characters, because it's actually, in practice, not that difficult to bridge into a lot of technology problems with good mentorship and sort of having fun with it. So that, that'll be the goal by the end of the day. Um, so if, you, if you've clicked on some of the references, there'll be a couple slide decks, one from last year, and then we had done another, that, a little bit more of the policy background. And then we'll also have um, a virtual computer that you can telnet into, if you will, SSH into, and type there if you have a laptop but you don't have the tools sorted. So we're going to talk about that briefly when we get to the workshop session. First, I want to start with um, a little bit about uh, an influential rulemaking that I've had some contact with over about the last 15 years. Um, and, and maybe one of the reasons why data in particular is a very compelling uh, area of sort of technical expertise for legal practice. This, as you can see, is um, a matter that started around 2009, and it was labeled in the matter of preserving the open internet broadband industry practices. Um, and you see a number of filings. For a lot of regulatory proceedings, you'd have a team of, say, younger to mid-grade mid attorneys partnered with economists or analysts. In many cases, uh, the kind of work that my office focuses on, there's spectrum issues, so you'll typically have an engineer teamed. But you might be looking at a set of printed documents in the tens, maybe 50. For a larger proceeding, you might have 100 or so. But the, the gist of it would be you'd be divvying up printed pieces of paper, reading through them, annotating them, just like we all learned in, in legal methods, some of us longer ago than others. Um, and there was a certain expectation about what the workflow would be like. Now, when you start looking at these proceedings, they start jumping from you know, maybe hundreds or even thousands to millions. This is a dramatic change in sort of the participation here. And it's a, it's a, it's a welcome thing, it's a wonderful thing, but it changes how the workflow works. It also, I think, in some way, um, will bring about changes in how we think about how we evaluate comments and how they work through 
administrative procedure law sort of features. How do you consider a proceeding that has millions or potentially maybe hundreds of millions of, of data points? Are we looking at it being not arbitrary, capricious on some percent probability basis? Is it some weird model that we, we really haven't even come to grips with? Regardless, it's not possible to take a team of three to five um, drafters and go through eight million comments. It's, it's not a physical possibility. So the numbers are driving some of this. Another point that I think is, uh, is not well understood um, outside of larger or organizations um, like the government or, or large enterprises is that most organizations are struggling with a transition from how they used to do things from an IT perspective and how they're doing it in a modern sort of environment. And, you're oftentimes dealing with systems that are in production, that have very, very uh, uh, difficult sort of uh, trade-offs, and downtime, pulling out a system, investing resources in exploring new ideas, and God forbid, you know, you have a system that just crashes and is unrecoverable, trying to, trying to plan for those sorts of scenarios is, is a really difficult problem. And, you know, it involves a lot of budgeting and other concerns, but um, fundamentally, uh, you know, when, when I started working, uh, started working in the CIO sort of space, um, understanding that there are hundreds of systems that if you wanted to spec these just from a, you know, really simple cost model, um, you'd be looking at hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of latent investment um, that it's unlikely that, uh, that at least our organizations might see anytime soon. So I just had to struggle with that problem of trying to deal with these legacy systems and modernize them in a context with limited resources, a lot of us have thought about how to do that. And one of the, one of the solutions that I think we'll talk about today is um, retooling people, bringing people out you know, from, from, from the sector that maybe um, you work with and incorporating their ideas and, and developing more collaborative approaches. But one, one step might be the legal hacker as a knowledge worker um, and being able to do more for himself. I can't imagine anyone in this room that's practicing that has probably a dedicated secretary or um, a typing staff, but that was absolutely the case, maybe even when some of the systems that I used at the FCC were first developed. Um, so the data role in the practice of law, I think, is changing, and you know we are, we're about predicting problems, we're about advising about potential scenarios, um, and a lot of times we don't really think of that sort of legal process as an algorithm. But in many ways, you can see that there are very, very strong similarities between how a computer scientist might think about um, structuring the flow of that process. Um, and you know, the, the prior uh, two speakers was talking about graph theory or acyclic graphs versus other kinds of graphs or other sorts of algorithmic approaches to thinking. You know, you can see a lot of value um, from, from those sorts of environments. Lawyers could learn a lot, I think, about how to think better um, from computer scientists. The other thing that I think is sort of the obvious point, and you know, you'll see it in most of the trade press and any sort of an advertisement, but big data is absolutely changing the, the, the marketplace. And so if we're talking about you know, the examples with numbers that we start with, in many ways, um, it's a volume problem, or it's a veracity problem, how you deal with the trust relationships that used to exist with a very limited number of players, that opens up and now it's not the same sort of, of relationship. Now there's a need for more for auditing or some sort of a, uh, a new sort of role for trust, or maybe the variety of things that you, you, you see in daily practice changes. Um, you might be expecting a certain format in a certain sort of style of drafting in a certain kind of argument style And then all of a sudden you get these completely out of the blue Why would you even say that that doesn't make it and then you have to think about it and oh well I guess you know that's actually really really insightful. I'd never we've never seen that before those sorts of problems also are, are Part of that big data problem the velocity of changes just the rate at which things come in you might have a, a predicted sort of flow maybe we bill this amount we've got these many associates this is how we absorb this kind of work and then all of a sudden you get a hundred times the demand for work how would how would you respond to that are the sorts of systems that we typically think of as law practice or, or government practice um, able to scale if you will in that way 
Um, and then a lot of people, when they talk about the five Vs, or some people will use more Vs, but the Vs of data, um, and big data in particular, they'll talk about the value propositions. You know, there, there is a value, and I think Corey, my colleague, um, talked yesterday about open data, um, and one of the insights that we discovered from, uh, from our work, you know, trying to open up more data across the federal agencies and states and municipalities is that we need a lot of data to make good decisions if, in fact, we're going to make good on the idea that we do data-driven analysis. Census data was one thing that she talked about. So as we're talking about how we might think about these sort of legal decisions or legal reasoning and how we can take advantage of it, there's all sorts of situations where you can see you have a certain relationship of something. Um, sometimes you're just looking for a comparison between two things. I want to know how many people in a particular geography have some characteristic. I need to know that because that's maybe legally required. There's some sort of a, a, a pressing function on it. Um, but sometimes that's not the only sort of filtering criteria. You might have other things, and they might come from different sources. You might be reviewing a case and considering, you know, all sorts of other information. What's the person's tax history? What's their credit background? Were there criminal issues involved? You might be vetting, you know, a company in a due diligence environment and see all sorts of considerations. And so that we're frequently pulling information from different environments, and intuitively, that seems like a really, really valuable proposition, but we don't always directly go to the website and download an Excel spreadsheet and then another Excel spreadsheet and then maybe find a way to make a comparison there and close the loop. You might have to ask somebody or maybe it would be a contracted effort or, a, or reports produced. So those are other things. And then we're thinking about persuasion. So much of legal practice is about trying to convince someone that this is the right answer or this is the likely scenario that will actually happen. And persuasion, um, you know, there's, there's thousands of years of, of history in rhetoric and, and all sorts of, of subtleties and how we deal with affective versus other sorts of persuasive arguments. And absolutely, some algorithms might be more persuasive than others or some applications or some tweakings of algorithms. And it makes a difference to understand how you weight different kinds of clustering algorithms or other things in an environment, say, with mobile privacy or something. Um, so you see that there's a melding of the domain knowledge, as a, as a person might describe, the legal or the policy analysis together with some of those technology decisions. And if you aren't able to at least converse in that, in that domain, it would be, I think, very difficult to practice there. And so I think what we're seeing also is sort of a stages of competency evolution with lawyers, with people who are technology professionals. Because oftentimes we don't know what we don't know yet, or sometimes we don't know that we have an insight, that we know something yet. And so a lot of people will talk about this stage or this process of exploring things so that you can at least know what you didn't have a real good handle on. Maybe those are things you just can't solve and you put them in the, I'll find somebody to do that work for me box. Maybe you have stuff that actually becomes part of a, a, a value proposition that's valuable. And here I think is the other point that we really want to focus on. And that is ultimately we're making decisions, sort of buy or build decisions, cross matrix decisions. How do you form new teams that are effective in a court of sort of legal technology environment? How do you leverage things in a way that you can um, do it faster, cheaper, more efficiently, better, bring better, um, better solutions to more people. How do we, how do, we do that? Um, and so I think from data science, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it actually has a very long history, uh, beginning around in the 60s when people really started to talk about theories of computing and, and a lot of um, uh, a more academic focus on computer science. Um, you, you saw words like datology or um, the use of data science as a substitute for the expression computer science. Um, and today, there are a lot of people um, uh, on sort of both sides of the marketing versus computer guy fence that will say, well, the term has become overloaded. It's, it's, it's more of a buzzword or marketing phrase for a lot of people. Maybe it doesn't have a lot of value, but at least for today's purposes, what I would propose is that there is a set of problems that we're going to look at today. And usually what we would see before would be there were particular people that would get a data set, for example, an Excel spreadsheet or something. Someone might be in the business of producing those and then marketing and then selling them. 
and then somebody would be working in, inside of an environment that they work in frequently, Excel or Stata or Informatica or whatever it might be. And then there was usually somebody that would like dress it up and put it into prose and to an environment that was focused on, on a particular uh, audience. And those might be lawyers in many cases. So these aren't, new, these aren't necessarily new topics, but the idea that a person can straddle all these different environments, can start to pull in insights from different sources, can make those glue together. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the practical implications of that now. Um, and I, I think I want to leave that sort of general discussion with two other points, which is um, for computer scientists, especially you start computer science and you, you take a couple classes, the first thing you, you learn is that your computer science PhD professor can't make his printer work. Because computer science is not about computers. It's about how you have computing problems and, and thinking about more what it is, you know, in some ways it's closer to the nature of cognition and thinking and language and expression. So computer science can be a very, very useful um, rubric for understanding a lot of reasoning problems because in a lot of ways computer science is a very applied field of philosophy or mathematics and so um, we want to think about what our theory what, what's what's the gist let's not get too into the weeds but um, let's try to maintain a view that there is an extremely valuable sort of uh, a thing going on we may not grasp it really well but it's it's worth us understanding both those, those layers at this point. The, the, th the third, last point is that um, a lot of people will talk about, especially on the hiring side, unicorns. You hire that person and they're the perfect person, they know everything about telecom policy, they got you know, a great solid background of all the sources of law, they know how people want to see the presentations, they're, they're, they're perfect in every way. And they're a computer science -y guy and they're this and then that. Um, those people in practice don't exist. Is, is, generally the, 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 the presumption in the industry. Unicorns don't exist. They're a magical creature that you chase around, and usually you end up with a cow with a horn. <laughs> now, I've been called a donkey, uh, but not, not in this session, so we'll wait for that to come. But unicorns are maybe a cross-functional or a management technique or maybe a project management technique that you can develop you're very unlikely to find a single individual that you can hire to do everything. You might need existing project managers. You might need to tool up staff at different layers. But in general, we want to talk about collecting and processing information into different systems, understanding APIs and data sources and how they're structured, what sort of gotchas you might have in, in pulling those things together. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that early. And then you have some environment you're going to work in some people are um, very opportunistic and will go from one environment to another. Some people, everything is SaaS. It doesn't matter what it is, it's SaaS. And you know, that's great, but you know, I, I can't afford the SaaS alliances. So I tend to be a little more opportunistic. And then on the other side, fundamentally people have some product. They're gonna have an insight. Sometimes that's for internal consumption and there's not really any elaborate um, sort of focus on visualizations or how you share the information. But that is also an area of data science that is very rich. So generally speaking, we're going to have three buckets. Finding data and sorting it and getting it all together, putting it in different environments, talking about a little bit about what the environments might offer you, and then how you share it and visualize it. So we're going to try to do that um, today. So if you haven't found a partner, um, what I'd like to do is if everybody could sort of like cluster around computers because um, we will be typing if someone has a computer or something. I, I could see like maybe four blocks. Um, Noah and the Kansas City contingent. Kansas. All right. And then up here, if you guys want to cluster around a little bit, up here I see more laptops and computer people. So this is, if, you, if, you, if you're wondering where you should go, you should, you should sit next to these guys over here. The Ukrainians and the Canadians. They, they win. They're, they're more awesome at, at, at computer stuff, I guess. And then back in the back, um, we're going to talk there. This is a thing to type on your command line. So the presentation is on Twitter. We're going to take, say, maybe a minute or so. Let's organize. If you know how to use SSH, there is a temp key pairing. 
that's available at the Google Doc link above that. Um, and you should be able to log into the Amazon uh, instance at the SSH that's below that. Otherwise, you can watch the videos and we'll talk through the stuff. Um, but I would encourage anybody, if you've got a computer, try to log into that if you can. If you're having trouble, uh, raise your hand or ask somebody around. Yes, so the link for the presentation is on Twitter. In the presentation on page 16 is the SSH details and the link to um, the credential file that you can use to log into that instance. Click on Twitter link, you'll get the, the presentation, turn to page 16. I didn't want to put the SSH out on my Twitter feed. I'm going to delete this immediately afterwards, but we needed a way to share the link so you didn't have to type all this gobbledygook in. Yes, Japan Law Prof. You can follow me on Twitter. Awesome. So, uh, I just like to say, Kansas contingent, the Canada guys, they're already done. So. Nate, get, where's your computer? Come on, guys. All right. So we're now going to step through the three stages, and we'll have some, some demonstrations. I think we may uh, run out of time with the R. A couple things as sort of like a background. Um, I'd started to think the FCC has an API now for our comment engine. And I had played around with it a little bit uh, this week and had some trouble pulling in. Um, great, awesome. Um, so one question was, well, what are some of the kind of data sets that you might stumble on? Some of them are going to be um, accessible via a web browser or a command line tool. And you can see here, this is the URI, the URL here. It says publicapi.fcc.gov. And so usually, if you're looking for a, a specific kind of data, you might find it on the domain name of that entity. Uh, there's a lot of different data sets that are available via some sort of a web interface. People usually talk about these interfaces as APIs. Um, that's just an acronym for an application programming interface. Um, but basically, it's just a window into that system. And if you look at, there's a, couple, there's a couple things here that are bolded. You see limit equals or total page count. Usually, the API will have a series of options. And in some cases, the options are all you really need, and you can look at those and find exactly what you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for all the comments that were filed in a particular regulatory proceeding on a particular day, and maybe you know the name of the entity that you're looking for, and you can narrow that search very, very well using the API. Initially, I thought, you know, we had our colleague talking about Watson and how you take text files and pull insights from that. A real common scenario would be I would pull the list of things I'm looking for, but then separately I'd have to pull all those documents down, and then I'd have to process them. That was one demo we could have gone through. We'll talk about how you know, that we, we could do that maybe as, a, as an online activity to follow up afterwards. Um, but another real common scenario is the API isn't exactly what you need, or the entity doesn't provide an API. And so there are a lot of data sets that you know, my colleague Corey talked about in the federal government that aren't available with some sort of search capability. Because ultimately what these URIs all these APIs are doing is they're letting you tune your, your search a little bit so you can narrow down what you're really interested in. And a lot of times that can be cumbersome, expensive, um, difficult to sell internally, and in many cases for a, a researcher, not really helpful. Because a lot of researchers that are from a more sort of traditional background are going to look for a different format for that data. They're not going to necessarily want to have the web API. They may look at something different. And so, for example, uh, a lot of the programs that you'll see that are surveys uh, or sort of foundational data, 
will be released in a big chunk of, of stuff. And usually they're compressed. And sometimes they'll be in zip. But a lot of times, you'll see at the very bottom something that says tar. And sometimes at the very end of the files, you'll see a GZ, or sometimes a BZ, or other thing at the end. And so the files, if, it, if they don't tell you on the website, can sometimes be a little have a little bit of variation. And so if you're trying to get started, it's good to know that if you install something, say on your Windows desktop or your Mac, that is able to decompress different kinds of archives, that is usually useful. If you're someone that has a programming background, a lot of this stuff is really intuitive. So you don't feel like you would need to explain something like that. And so you'll find a lot of data sets that can be really, really valuable, but a little bit difficult if you haven't made that step into playing around with tar balls, as they're typically called. So what we did was we downloaded um, a, 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 a popular data set from, from my office in the Office of Engineering and Technology at the FCC about broadband performance. And this is a study that we've run for about seven years. There's about 10,000 boxes distributed randomly throughout the United States. And they run software on essentially a little Wi-Fi box. And every hour, they're executing different measurements. And so we take all of those measurements, and we process them, and we release uh, information about them in a report. And then we, we separate out the stuff that we process, the data sets from the month of September. And then we also have all the raw data that we collect during the rest of the year. And so researchers you know, from places like MIT or Georgia Tech or, or Berkeley or Colorado, a lot of people that are interested in how the internet functions might dig really deeply into this data. If you're an econometrician, you might use that for sort of multimodal analysis with you know, you know, essentially an industry perspective. How does the presence of good broadband on the fixed side affect mobile performance? Or you know, are there correlations or inferences you can draw with um, demographics like income or density of population or other things? So you can see that um, there'd be a lot of people that would look at that. But it usually takes a little bit of investment. And once you've done it, then you get on this sort of data-driven track, and it, it's easier. So you download the file. There's a whole bunch of gobbledygook in there. You'll see the dot SQLs and the .csvs, and SQL is an acronym um, and uh, is, is, a, is a language that you can use to deal with data. So a good starting point is to understand something about SQL, or the Structured Query Language. It is a standard interface across any system. Um, there are a lot of really exciting new ways to process data. But SQL is absolutely a lingua franca. It is never going away. If you're going to work on Watson or Azure or some niche platform, there will always, in most cases, be um, a SQL interface into the data. So it does make sense to invest a little time in at least understanding what SQL is. So we're going to start there. This table is a table that shows what each of those little boxes um, have in terms of information about where they're located or um, which provider uh, that, that service is connected to, what kind of technology it is, um, other information about the time or the state, you know, the location. Um, and so one thing, and this is where if you're logged in right now or you've had a chance to, uh, to look at the files, you download the file from our website. And these are usually, you know, clustered together in, in easy ways. EPA has a bunch of interfaces. If you do energy work, you'll find a lot of energy-related stuff. Uh, obviously, NIST and NIH on, on uh, the health side have a lot of cool information. And Census. Census is a fundamental data set that you'll, at some point, end up learning about. Um, but a real common problem is you download the data, and they were using it in one environment, and you're using it in a different environment, and there's subtle differences. And in some cases, those will shut you down. And it's very common to try to get into this stuff, and it's just not working. You're like, forget it. I just spent three hours on this, and now I'm done. What I did is I down, and I know this data set really well. I downloaded just what would happen if I just did this, how long would it take me. It took about well, maybe an hour and a half, two hours. And I know the data well, and I sort of know what I'm doing. Oh my gosh, that's a scary thought. But um, it, 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 there were problems. So I downloaded this, this file that had all this data in this, um, in this format. 
and there was a remove in one of the columns. And that column, it turns out, is the speed of the connection. When you order broadband at home, oftentimes you get like a six megabit tier, or a 10 megabit, or a 50 megabit, or whatever. And somebody threw remove in what was supposed to be a number column. Now, the problem with computers is they're only marginally smarter than I am. And so they're kind of dumb. And so the download, that, that processing field, when I tried to pull it into the database, didn't know what to do with it. Said, I, hey, yikes, syntax, double, ah, and it just doesn't work. And then you're going to look at how to cleanse that field so that you can fix it, so it'll import. This is really representative. You're mixing different kinds of data, number data with string data, you'll oftentimes have a conversion or an import problem. Very classic problem with database administration. It's a real pain in the neck. Sometimes it can be very tedious. Sometimes you end up having to go into a file and physically make changes. But you'll see down here, all my problems went away when I typed, what, 10 characters, 20 characters at the bottom here. And what this does is, is it runs a program called Perl, and it could have been anything. Paul, thank you for your suggestions for Python, and there's a thousand different ways to do this. But this is usually what we would call a search and replace function. What I want is wanting to do is take every instance of remove and replace it with minus one. There are usually conventions when you're dealing with data. And you, you know, we use these conventions in the practice of law. You'll write a brief and you'll put inner alley or you know, whatever. And people, people identify that and it's meaningful in that context. In a lot of situations with numbers in particular, if you use a negative number where it should be something positive, like you don't have minus one megabits per second speed tiers, it's used as a code word. And oftentimes you'll see minus one or zeros or minus 65,665. You'll use an edge of those numbers. And, and so that's a, that's a pretty common technique. It, it fixes my problem because I know now that that remove is different than the other stuff. So I preserve a little bit of information about the source of the data. And I also make it so it's no longer text. And so that was, that was an easy problem to fix. So now I've got a table in that database that has really, really cool stuff. It has what we would call a primary key, which is just something that you can use to compare information across different data sets. And in this case, it's a unit ID. Each box has a number, and anytime we do anything with our data, it'll have that unit ID associated with it. And then the other stuff, this is stuff that I don't need in every column about how fast was your broadband or what was the latency, but I do want it somewhere. And so usually you'll separate these out and you develop a relationship. There's a relationship between something in this data set and something somewhere else. And usually you have at least one primary key, but sometimes more things that you can compare. But in this case, I might want to know stuff about the ISP or the technology or stuff like that. All right, so that's set up. And then the next step, was um, I was looking at the data, and, and sometimes, especially with data entry, if someone's physically typing something, you get people typing things differently. And so <clears throat> when I had looked at, for example, just New York, I wanted to see how many instances of New York were in the unit table, and it was about 300, but it turned, about, turned out about a third of them were lowercase, and two thirds or so of them were uppercase. That's a problem again, because if you have a flat filter and I just say, compare capital N, capital Y, give me everything, I would lose a third of the data. And it might lead you into inferences or conclusions that would be faulty. You might be excluding all the ones from somebody's area, or there might be characteristics about those boxes that might be meaningful. Sometimes statisticians will talk about heteroscedasticity, or variations in kinds of data that are meaningful. They're part of a big clump of things, but sometimes you can see these differences in the data sets. And so I wanted to clean that up. It's very common to use update and set functions in SQL. So you can see you basically have you know, this command. You put in um, the name of the table, wherever the data is in your database, and then there's a set, that has to be there. And then one of those is the variable that was in the table. And usually I 
I'm flipping back and forth to things like this and say, well, how did it, how did I spell it? Is it state or was it, you know, ST? So a lot of times you're going back and forth between data dictionaries or some sort of descriptors that will tell you exactly what you're looking for because again, computers are pretty dumb. But that was it. You, you typed it in. I said, I want to replace all the lowercase guys or anything else with New York. I just want to clean it all up so when I do a query, I don't have to, to fiddle with this. And so there's some magic things in here like a tilde and an ampersand. That just means I want to ignore the case and I want you to give me everything that matches an N and a Y. And you see that's enumerated here by single quotations. And so there is a little bit of syntax to learn. In SQL, you always use a single quotation mark for text and things like that. You don't use a double quotation. Um, and so there, there are sometimes things, you pick them up. I, I remember spending a week and a half on something and I, and I had double quotes in it and it wasn't working and eventually I read the manual. I don't recommend that either. So the other data set, uh, there was a whole bunch of them in there, all sorts of different information about latency and DNS lookups and web timing and web load timing and all sorts of cool info. This one though is HTTP GET. And so when you have a web service in particular, people will talk about GETs and post, uh, posts are real common, there's other commands. But in, in effect, when you see GET, you know you're pulling something down from a website. That's a download. And so in this table, you'll see the unit ID for a given box. You'll see the time that the measurement was taken. And then other stuff like which website did it talk to when it made its test happen? Or how much time did it take to set up the connection? What was the total amount of, of data that was passed during that test? But the thing that mostly we're interested in is this, the bytes sec. This is a statistic that's processed on the box and says this was what the mean was for that test. And a lot of times it makes a difference whether it was a mean or a median or something else, but I'm going to hold that a little bit for, for uh, about two slides down. So I know what that table looks like. I have that command. Um, and uh, I type my, uh, my copy function, which takes the CSV file and tries to put it into my table. And I got another error, invalid input syntax for integer slash n. Well, an integer is a number, a whole number, um, and not one that has decimals, a floating number, a real number. Um, and slash n is not a number. So, okay, I know that there's something in one of those columns, and if you looked at the source file, you'd see that there's this little slash n between these two numbers. Now, why is it there? Those, in, in some cases, can be really, really interesting problems, technical problems, sometimes policy problems, but I do know that there's an n there, and I want to get rid of it because I can't copy my data into the table and do things like calculate how fast something is, the speed of the broadband. So I use another technique. You know what, sometimes if something's cumbersome and it's in the weeds, I'm just gonna delete it from the file. Sometimes when you're trying to do a search and replace, and I was trying to do it on my thumb drive, which is not super fast, and one of the problems with setting up the demo this time was like, what could I do with just my laptop today? Um, and it turns out not as much as I wanted, because I had to do all this goofy stuff and I ended up using a thumb drive to store the file and then, this, this command is, is very common, G-R-E-P, grep. Uh, you'll find it in almost any Unix-based system. It'll be on your Macintosh computers. Um, it's probably on your Macintosh phone even, but I haven't checked that. It's definitely on Android phones. Um, but if you add something in on these command lines, you type the command, usually there's a number of things you can add to it. We usually call those parameters or switches. If you add a, a hyphen, and V, what that says is, what you're gonna type next, I'm gonna ignore those. If I see that line, I'm gonna delete it from the output. So grep minus V is uh, pretty handy, especially if you just wanna bang something out. And then at the end here, you see this little redirection sign, the, the greater than sign here. What that says is, take whatever the command is doing and put it in a file. Now, 
not, not too complicated here. We got grep minus v, and then I've got that quite cumbersome slash n. I'm saying anytime you see slash n, just dump it. I'm not even interested in it. And the file I'm looking at is in the temporary directory, and it's called cur underscore http get mt dot csv. Put everything that is cleaned up and gotten rid of all of that cumbersome slash ends and put it in this new file called blah, 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 hyphen pass. Now, when we go back to the database and we type ps sql and we run the command and we slash copy, then it loads all of the information from that file into the database. Now, this was probably about five minutes, 10 minutes of fiddling around, and some of it was just waiting for the files to update. So at some point, if you understand at least a few ways to do something, and you can Google it and find a way to do it a thousand different other ways, but find one way to do search and replace, it will happen on every data problem. It's very rare that you have a data set that's so clean you don't have to fiddle with it at all. Either you're gonna be working in the environment or you're gonna be working on the loading side. So this area um, is sometimes also called uh, ETL. And so you're talking about extracting data and loading it from different sources. And pulling big chunks of data across systems has traditionally been pretty cumbersome. Um, these are really improving. Uh, it's great to see APIs that can link things and it's all transparent. Um, but that's the topic that we talked about earlier. I tried to do it that way and it didn't work. So there's very rarely a silver bullet. So let's move on to the processing side of stuff. Now, once it's in an environment, you're gonna to wanna to do stuff with it. And in this case, um, we're going to look at the tables. And the table might have um, the stuff that I talked about before. It might be the one that has the unit IDs and it'll tell me which carrier and which technology it is. Or maybe it's the one that has how fast was this measurement. And what I wanna do is maybe in some cases compare those two things or use them as filters on each other. And usually there's going to be a very stock way of writing a query. And, and again, it's sort of like that search and replace thing. You can learn one way to do it, glue in the stuff that you know about, and if you have a, a model that's working and you've worked with the data set, usually it's a matter of just changing the words a little bit. So select just says, hey, I want you to pull some information from a table, and blah, 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 blah. Sometimes we want everything that's in the table, usually not. Sometimes we want one field, and then oftentimes, we might process something in that field. And sometimes there's some trickery there that we'll talk about. From is really important. And I'll tell you, I spent probably, again, like several weeks trying to get comfortable with different ways of writing where the table is. Because you come into this and you're like, you, you, you have very weak understanding of what the database is. You got these things called tables. And then you have to like type them exactly correctly or it doesn't work. It's tedious, and that's why having a pattern and copying and pasting in and out of a working pattern is a good way to start. So we're, we're talking about the unit ID table and the cur underscore HTTP get blah, 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 blah. We're gonna see that in the next slide. Where fields are also very important, and this is where you include in a SQL query the filters. So you might have something like, I only wanna see stuff from today or from a date span, or I only wanna see connections that were cable boxes. So we'll look at that in a, in, in a slide here going down um, and see how powerful that is. The other thing that's really, really powerful in a SQL context is being able to aggregate information into statistics. And so a very common problem is you want to run a query and find out what the average of something was or how many instances of something were or how many instances or averages or whatever statistic per category of thing. And you use the group by function at the end of this query to do that. And usually you're gonna have the name of the variable that you want to. And so again, you'd go back to what that table looks like, you'd make sure you typed it correctly, and that's where you would put group by. The end clause is also very powerful, especially when you're doing sort of analysis around groups of data. Having tells you something about that aggregation. And there's limits to being able to work on aggregations. But in general, you might say, um, I only want to look at boxes that had a certain number of measurements. Maybe the boxes that didn't have enough measurements weren't very interesting, and I don't want to see those. 
or maybe there's too many measurements, or maybe you're looking for states that had a certain number of something, or people that had a number of instances. You might use that havings clause to do that. All right, so this is a select statement. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. Um, and I think in terms of time, I wanna actually just go to the slides and then I'm gonna put the, uh, the videos up here in a second. We can play with the examples after we're done. But we see the select statement. The next statement there, it comes after the select, is something about the data in that table. And you see it says count. And then there's a parenthesis and a star in it. Star is, generally speaking, something that means apply it to everything. Just that's the all, that's the all you can eat bucket. I don't want to know how much it costs. What's the flat fee? You put a star in count, that's going to tell you how many rows, how many measurements came out of whatever query you're doing. That's, that's a way to get the number of instances. So for example, if you understand a little bit about statistics, it's important to know whether or not an average had five measurements or 5,000. You might need to know that, for example, if you're evaluating whether or not you have a lot of confidence in the average or not. And so generally speaking, if it's more than 30 or so, and you have a really nice distribution and it meets other sorts of criteria, a statistician might say, yeah, you can get away with 25, or maybe less, but that's, that's more statistical ma magicry. But generally, at some point, depending on the number of things you're comparing and the, the number of sort of inferences you're drawing, you might have to have more samples. So it's usually a good idea, and oftentimes you'll see queries with a number count at the side. The next one is AVG, and AVG is just the average. This is the arithmetic mean. And so if you remember maybe having had a stats class, all we're doing is we're taking all the stuff and we're dividing it by the number of the stuff. So if I have, in this case, 99,000 measurements, and we total all of the numbers in the numerator, in the top of the ratio, and in the bottom, in the denominator, we have the number of those measurements, that will give us the average. And this command calculates that for you. But there's a little bit more going on here. Um, and this is an important point. We talked about the byte sec being an average. Well, a lot of times, you may not want to know that value in the format that the programmer put it in. In this case, we would probably want to see megabits per second, which is generally what a consumer or a layman would know is the speed. But to get that value, I have to multiply it by a number to shrink it down in effect and move the decimal places over and switch it between bits and bytes. And so that's what this multiply by 0 .005. And um, I wish I had like a Flight of the Concords soundtrack going, because this would be that the humans are dead right now. So if you just play that in your head, the humans are dead. The humans are dead. And, and it's actually, it's, it's only an average though. So I, I think averagely speaking, most humans are dead. Um, mean, is, mean is the arithmetic mean. So if you see as after this, a lot of times it's good to rename the values. Because especially if you have different functions in a select, they'll get cluttered. And you want to change the name to something that's meaningful you often will use as. But you have to be careful because sometimes if you include stuff at the end because you didn't include a comma, it confuses the select and it will rename the thing rather than giving you the variable that maybe you wanted. If there was a variable in that table that was called mean and really what I wanted to do was have a comma, you just have to watch for things like that. So there, there are some tedious things here, but this is, I mean, everybody knows how to blue book. There's nothing more tedious in computer science than what you've experienced in law school, in my view. So the next thing then is percentile cont and a parenthesis and a 0.5. So this goes into a little bit about statistics, but statistics um, is a very dense discipline, but it's also something that, that you can understand at a high level. You can, you can spend six hours on a Code Academy or an MITx course and, and basically come away with most of what you need for a passable level of, of data analysis. In general, means, arithmetic means, and medians um, are used differently. They have different strengths and weaknesses. 
Um, they, in many cases, are, are really important to choose if you have a data set with lots of varying values. So for example, um, when I'm doing analysis on mobile data, I typically want to see a median or some, we usually call it five number statistics. Or what was the bottom 25% and the top 25% and then the 50% in the middle. And uh, you, know, you can imagine a normal distribution, sort of like one of those curves. You draw a line in the middle. The mode is the one that's the most common value. Medians are the 50th item in the list. And then a lot of times you're looking at the 25 or the 90th percentile or the 5th percentile or, or whatever. But this is, this is a calculation to do that. It's very intuitive. You have to put the right decimal in, in the parenthesis, and that's it. The within group is just saying, which variable am I trying to calculate? And so that's where we plugged in the same thing we did with the average. But in this case, we come up with the median. This next is the technology. So we talked about how the boxes have different technologies. Some of them are cable boxes, some are DSL. If you're thinking about a criminal justice project, this might be the kind of crime or infraction or, or resolution of the case. You can imagine doing an aggregation that might you know, be dividing up the different responses by some variable. And this is how you would do that. We see our from clause, we see our curve, blah, blah, blah. And then this is a pattern that oftentimes you'll just memorize. And there's different ways to do it, but this way is in some cases more intuitive. You have a parenthesis. And it's saying, I want to do a query. And this one is pretty easy, right? It just says, tell me what the, that unit ID is and the technology type from the unit table. So this is giving us a technology thing and saying, I just want New York State stuff. So here's where we limited the query to New York State. That goes together with the speed statistics. And at the end here, this is the glue that says, when I'm looking at this table, make sure it matches the number, that unit ID. Because you want to make sure you're getting the right speed measurements for the right boxes. And that's how you would make that correspondence. And this is where we talked about relationships and relational queries. This is all you need to know to do a whole lot of very useful analysis. This is a relational query in a box. Um, the end is our group by, and then at the bottom you see what the output looks like. We see the number of observations, we see the mean, we see the medians, and then we see the technology. Well, it might be interesting to know something more. Maybe we want to know, for example, what different ISPs are run. Or maybe we wanted to learn something else. And this is where you might be looking at other data sets and comparing them in ways that would be responsive to um, your particular search criteria. And then you'd just, you'd need to find a pattern that fits something you understand, or you'd ask somebody, is there another way to do this? And they might say, well, you know, it turns out if you've got two tables, there's this thing called inner join that's really handy. Or actually, this would be a left outer join, or whatever else. But these are things that you can Google, you can run through a couple exercises, and in general, um, understand very quickly. Now, <clears throat> we can imagine now, we're doing, we're, we've done some queries, we've got some data, and this might be a really valuable chart. You might imagine, for example, um, wanting to know what the average or the median performance is for different things, or how many people were incarcerated in this uh, police jurisdiction or other. And then you're going to think about how you present that stuff. Now, for me, this is super intuitive. I don't really want to see a bunch of fancy charts and gizmos and stuff. I love the command lines, but sadly, I don't always win the day, and people say, I'd like to see a map. Who wants maps? Maps is whatever. So you, you have to make maps, you have to make charts, and things like that. And so the process of creating a visualization that's compelling, that's easy to understand, is a very, very interesting process among all those other things that you've already done. You've got your data, and then understanding, am I presenting to my senior management? They're going to want a one-pager. I have to have the most compelling information in the easiest way to read in about a five-second, 15-second block. There has to be all the takeaways, and it has to be um, in a color that colorblind people can see, because that, that's what I do. Um, but you can do this kind of stuff, again, with a lot of tools that are free that you can install on your laptop. Uh, there's, there's tools that are web-based that you can work with, and we've heard of some of those things. And so what I think your next step might be is if you're thinking about, well, I want to evaluate some of these tools. I want to play around with them a little bit. There are people who will essentially mentor you in these different environments. But it's, it's good to have somebody you can work with who knows what your data looks like 
so they can help you visualize it or process it or in ingress it in ways that are useful. But at the end of the day, those are the basics to get to the point where you can make an Excel spreadsheet. Typically what I do with my teams is I'll export the CSVs, I give it to our, uh, our data analyst, and I have him do the charts because it's just not something that I'm interested in. I'm doing all the data backend stuff, I hand it off to him, and there we have that example of sort of that cross matrix scenario. If I have to make a chart, I can, uh, but so could my boss. And so being able to get the data in the form that you can process it and work in the environments, I think is the more critical skill. Um, we can talk more about that, CDFs, histograms, other stuff, but maybe we'll play around. I think we have another five, 10 minutes now, or no. Jameson's giving me, that's the more aggressive, you've ran out of, of, of the typos. So I hope this was helpful, and uh, you guys all have my contact info. I'd be happy to follow up. We'll probably do some more of these maybe online workshops coming up. Great, thanks.